usually who stands up here is Kevin and Mark. Kevin's on vacation with his wife. He'll be home tomorrow. Please pray for traveling mercies. He flies home. We're surprised but very pleased that Mark and Valerie are here. We pray your blessings on you as you listen to the doctor and your wife, and that you'll heal and you'll be back up here to preach to us. But until then, we're very fortunate to have, he's known as Christopher Lee, but at Rise, when he worked here a couple of years ago, they call him Mr. Chris. And his wife, Kristen, is here with him, and we're glad that they're here, and some of his church family where he's a pastor. So we look forward to hearing from you, Mr. Chris. All right, good morning, church. All right, praise God we are here. If you would, you can see the passage on the board there. Acts chapter 9 is where we will be today. As you are turning in your scriptures to Acts chapter 9, and I encourage you to do so, I'll open this up in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you that we are in your house. That, Lord, it is today in which you draw your people onto this Christian Sabbath. Lord, to rest, to be taught, to be equipped, and to praise your name. And so, Jesus, we thank you that we are here. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that is in this very house today. And so, Lord, as we go into your word, may we be still. Lord, we we will heal over your word today, but we also must go back into the prayer closet to reflect upon that word, to meditate upon it, and to allow it to pierce our hearts where our hearts need to be pierced, and then to go back to you with praise. And so, Jesus, we praise you, and it's in your name, amen. So, I've been preaching, and I'm going to talk to you for a minute as I pull up my stuff here. I've been preaching uh, to Walltown Baptist Church uh, through the books of Acts. So, you may be wondering, um, why did you choose Acts 9? Uh, The reason being is this is where I fell uh, with uh, Walltown Baptist. And it's actually a beautiful passage to which we'll be able to uh, go into. So as you have turned to Acts chapter 9, let us bring our attention to verses 1 through 19. This is again the Word of God. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings, and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went on to the high priest, and desired of him letters of Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound onto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecute. And it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled, and astonished, said the Lord, What wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men journeyed with him and stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and as when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in the vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire of Judas for one called Saul, of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. 
and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints of Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, and he entered the house, and putting his hands on him, he said, and and really listen to this, it's beautiful. Brother Saul, Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in thy way as thou comest hath sent me, and thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. And then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. Today we will examine the conversion of Saul. And we want to ask this this question, these three questions here. Why conversion needs to take place? What true conversion is? And living out that conversion. Before we do so, we need to understand a little bit about Saul. Perhaps many of you in this church today know the story. Well, Saul became Paul. Saul was just a a bad dude living a bad way and all of a sudden Jesus encountered. Well, it's a little bit deeper than that. And perhaps you're sitting here today, such as our children in the back, that may have never heard about Saul. And maybe you're sitting here a little bit older and never heard about Saul. So I want to give us a little bit of a background of who Saul is. So Saul, yes, we know him as a religious leader, taught by the Pharisees, a Pharisee himself, very knowledgeable. Saul's upbringing was in the Jewish religion from the line of Benjamin. So there were 12 tribes and and Saul being a part of this line. So Saul has a great understanding of the law of God. He was taught the law of God from a young age. He grew up to be a Pharisee, a rabbi. Saul was a brilliant man. He would have read the prophet's words. He would have read the words of Moses. And he would have known the word of God. In fact, he knows the word of God. He knows the law. He preached the law. So for all intents and purposes, we can look at Saul and say, who is Saul? Saul, for our common language today, is perhaps the unconverted church member who has an academic degree, who wears the tie, who knows exactly what the word is, but yet doesn't believe. And so Saul, a man who knows this, is a man unconverted, is a man whose life has actually gone totally away from the Lord even while being in the presence in the temple and teaching the Word, he is a man who has walked away from God. He is a man who has rejected God and His law. He is a man who does not chase after the heart of God. He is a man who doesn't meditate on the law of God. But he is a man, as Psalm 1 says, that will face the wrath of God. But yet Saul is a Pharisee. He is a teacher of the law. So it is here that we often get stumped. It's often here that from the outside looking in, 
How can a man that studies the law is a rabbi that teaches the law be unconverted? How could such a man walk away from God when he had such blessings flowing into him? And it is a blessing, dear children, that you are here and are able to sit under the Word of God. But yet, Saul wouldn't know God. And so it is here we must examine this text of who Saul is. And I want to go back to verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went on to the high priest. So here we have another examination of who Saul is. Saul here, roughly 20, 30, maybe of age, has hatred in his heart. But yet we know the law of God says to love your neighbor. We get that in Deuteronomy. But yet here, Saul has such profound hatred over those that would follow the way. And we hear the word the way, so let me break this down. It means, Christian, those who are following Christ. And so Paul would go, Saul, sorry, Saul would go to the high priest, and Saul would ask, let me bind up those who follow thy way. Let me bring them on to Jerusalem. And so going back just a couple chapters back, Here's what Saul, at least from a bystander perspective, did. He may not have thrown the rock. He may not have given the authority to say, go throw the rock. But at least in minimum, he was at the scene. Being a witness onto it. And then later doing these very acts himself. We go to the first deacon of the church, Stephen. Who was martyred who was stoned to death. And here Saul is asking the high priest, let's do this some more. Let's have an onslaughter of those that follow the way because they're getting in our way. And how dare they do that? So it is no wonder that Ananias, when the Lord is telling him to go to Saul, he has great work for me, I have chosen him. That Ananias is like, are you sure? Because this is a man that has done great evil. Now we have a picture of Saul. But I want to challenge you with this doctrine. This doctrine is called total depravity. Sinful nature. And while we look at Paul and we say, Saul is such an awful guy, filled with sin and hatred, even amongst being in a religion that doesn't teach that. We must examine our own souls, and we must examine our first question, which is this, why conversion? Or a more biblical term, regeneration, to be born again. Because man's heart is against God from birth. Because of the first man created, Adam, fell into sin. It brought with it sin and a hatred towards God and His law to worship anything but God into all of mankind. So we have there in words you may be familiar with or may not be, the depravity of man, the sin of man, which all of us in the first Adam have by nature. Our birth by nature is to be opposed to God, is to be opposed to His law. Growing up in the church doesn't save you. For Saul himself grew up in the temple, and it didn't save him. But we must ask, what is this doctrine of total depravity 
And I want to give you from the 1689 London Baptist Confession, which teaches this. By God's appointment, they were the root, the representatives of the whole race. Because of this, this guilt of their sin was accounted and their corrupt nature passed on to all their offspring who descended from them by ordinary procreation. Their descendants are now conceived in sin and are by nature children of wrath, the servants of sin and partakers of death and all other miseries, spiritual, temporary, meaning the physical, and eternal, unless the Lord Jesus sets them free. So here we examine what is going to happen to Saul is a regeneration, a rebirth of his very nature, of his very soul, which is against God. He has to be set free from this. Just as you who are sinning in this room, if you do not know Christ, you too must be set free from the nature that binds you to hate God and to worship idols. And idols can be as simple as I attend church on Sunday. Is that not good enough? I serve in the diaconate. Is that not good enough? Your religion doesn't save you. Christ saves you. Saul's religion couldn't save him. Only Christ can save Saul. So it is there that we go back to question one. Why conversion? Why regeneration? Why must I be born again? Because you cannot and you will not worship God without Christ impacting and piercing the depraved soul that is within. You cannot be saved without Christ. You cannot be saved without His Spirit coming upon you and regenerating your soul. You cannot be saved. And you are created with a distinct purpose by the God Almighty to worship Him and glorify Him. I love what the Westminster Catechism says. What is the chief end of man? But the chief end of man is this, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And if you are depraved, if you are an enemy of God, you cannot live out that which you were created for. Because the first Adam brought sin into the nature of man. But in the second Adam, Christ, man is made new. So why did Saul need to be regenerated? Because just like you and me, the chief end of our purpose is to glorify God. And God has a distinct purpose for those in whom He elects unto salvation. So praise God for the reason of regeneration, which is for His glory and His glory alone. Which now brings us into verses 3 to 5. I want to read that for you as we further understand this depravity. And he journeyed and he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. 
And we may look at depravity, and we may look at Saul, and we may say, well, didn't he do a little bit of good? At least he was teaching. At least he was an upright citizen. At least he wore his tie the proper way. At least his shirt was tucked in. At least he's not a hooligan running around. I want to bring you to this illustration, which is not mine. It's actually an illustration by Ray Pritchard. And he says this. If he was to invite you, or if I was to invite you over to my house for breakfast, and I am not, I love you, but I am not, I can't feed all of you. But if I were, and I had six eggs in the fridge, and I was going to make an omelet out of those six eggs, and I have the green onions cut up, I have the bacon and the, and the good Gouda cheese, you know, high end, I'm not going to feed you this quality stuff, high end stuff, but all of a sudden you start to smell something rotten in the air. And I'm plating your food at this time. And you were say, Pastor, what is that awful smell? Oh, I just had one bad egg in the, ad, in the, in the pack there. It was just rotten. But it's okay. You would never accept that food. Despite the other five eggs being good, you would never accept it. Well, that is the sight of any works Onto God that does not glorify Christ, that is not in Christ. It will not be accepted. That worship will not be accepted. Saul's acts will not be accepted because Christ and Christ alone saves. Depravity is a real thing. We're going to skip here, we're going to come back to it. But we want to ask the question, what is conversion? Biblically, what is regeneration? Go with me now to 17 through 19. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and, and putting his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul. And I, and I just love that. Just stop there for a minute. He, he declares, Brother Saul. Saul's a bad dude. Initially he said, Lord, this man did such evil, but yet now he's calling him brother. Ananias knows what the Lord is about to do. I just love that. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in thy way as thou comest, hath sent me, and thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. That regeneration of his soul, the gift of Christ sending his spirit into Saul. So we must look at this second doctrine today. The doctrine of regeneration. And what is it? And how does it happen? First, it is nothing. And I mean absolutely nothing that you could draw to yourself. And it is a gift from God unto you who more elect. Unto salvation. It is here that the Holy Spirit comes upon the depraved soul. The soul at war with God. The soul that does not want to worship God. The Holy Spirit comes in and regenerates that soul. Creates a new. Creates a soul that cries out, My God, I repent of my sin. And I confess You are Lord and Savior of my life. I have no place to go but to worship you, to glorify you, and to follow you. Saul, now by the gift of God, through the acting of the Holy Spirit, and the redemption of Christ, becomes saved. The triune nature of God is the outflowing and the working of salvation onto man. 
So what is regeneration? It is the choosing, the election, the gifting of the Holy Spirit, and the atonement of Christ set upon you, His creation, to be set apart, to be made holy, to be made righteous in Christ and Christ alone, to give glory unto God. Now let us go back and go back to 15 and 16. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Now listen to this. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So here's, here's where we are. We've discussed the nature of man. We discussed regeneration. And now we have to go to living out our conversion. Saul would have to live out his conversion, his new birth, his life in Christ, just as you who are in Christ must live out your salvation. It would cost Saul his life. It would cost Saul his health. It will cost Saul his freedom to follow Christ, to glorify Christ. And yet Saul, being chained up in a prison, in a dark prison, it's not three meals and a hot cot and a gym membership. It's not a pristine silver toilet. It's not your jails today. It is a deep, dark pit being chained. And he would state these words. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. Take a man that is in a tie and slacks and is used to that lifestyle And tell him it will cost you your health. You're going to be bitten by a snake. You're going to fall ill. The Roman government is going to go after you. And you're going to be chained. And eventually you're going to be killed for following Jesus Christ. Who wants to sign up? Only those who understand. And only those who are regenerated. Only those whose deep Desire is Christ and to worship Christ and nothing but Christ. See this, that I will give everything because it is worth everything. And Saul would be called to that. Just as you, Christian, are called to that. I turned on the the media yesterday and I, I hardly do so. And I caught the tail end of the story, so I don't know the full story. But there's a missionary couple in Haiti who were murdered because they were doing God's work. Haiti is not a tropical island where, where we're, you know, drinking mojitos and having a good time. It's a hard island. It's a hard nation filled with pagan rituals. And here they are serving Christ, and here they would give their life, leaving behind families. But friends, that is the life of a Christian. Jesus taught this. He said, you will follow me. But what he didn't say was, if you follow me, I will give you riches. I will give you a white picket fence. I will give you a fancy church. I will let you be comfortable in an AC building, which thank you, Mark, for turning on the AC. But he did say this. He said, I will give you a cross, and you will bear it for my name's sake, for my glory, and my glory alone. Christianity is not about you. You being saved is not about you. 
It's about Christ. It's about glorifying Christ. It's about being a pure bride. It's about entering into glory to worship Christ and Christ alone. It's always about Christ. And it may cost you everything, but it's worth everything. And Saul would have to do that. So what does this mean for you today? If you are of the religious, do not trust your religion. Just because you spent eight decades in a church doesn't mean you spent eight decades knowing Christ. You need to get with God. And you need to get right. If you have become the Paul, and your Saul days are over, so you are now following Christ, it does mean He may call you to take up your cross. He will call you to sacrifice the idols that still remain. Because until the trumpets call or until we meet the Lord through death, we wrestle with the flesh. So you will have to carry a cross. There is no prosperity gospel. There is no social gospel. There is the taking up the cross to give everything to Christ because He is worth everything. That is the call of a Christian life. And to the kids in the room, my deepest prayer, some of them just walked out, so I got one in the room, right? two in the room. Praise God. My deepest prayer, children, is that you would know Christ. Listen to your parents. Receive Him and follow Him. Your life, Christian, is to glorify Christ and Christ alone. It is to live out the ways that Saul, who became Paul, would. And it is to say with all conviction of heart, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Let Christ be your gaze. And if He is not, I pray for the moment you go blind so that you can see. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your mercies and Your grace. And indeed, You sent Christ to redeem Your chosen. And so, Christ, we ask You, whenever sin remains in us, May you destroy it violently so that we may honor and glorify you and be the bride in which you have called us to be. And Spirit of God, for those not in Christ, regenerate the soul. Jesus, we thank you. And we praise you. Amen.